certain foods have a cult-like following. A janitor at Frito-Lay invented Flamin' Hot, and now it's one of America's favorite snacks. It goes beyond just being a product and a snack. It's actually considered a lifestyle. Blue Bottle went from a single coffee cart to a coffee empire. Those things that made it slightly more labor intensive, a little bit harder, a little bit more expensive, those were actually the differences that attracted people. Sweetgreen grew a billion dollar business selling salad. When you take one of those big established things that everybody already eats and you innovate around that category, it can create growth in what is otherwise a pretty flat marketplace. In America, went all in on Oatly. When we entered the US, we had no idea how big it was gonna become and, and especially not how fast it was going to happen. This is Suddenly Obsessed. It seems like you can't go anywhere without seeing Flamin' Hot Cheetos. From food pop-ups, to fashion retailers, to music videos, to makeup tutorials. Uh, this whole thing is bizarre to me. Here's how Flamin' Hot went from a janitor's vision to a worldwide phenomenon. The rise and popularity of Flamin' Hot is unlike anything else we've ever seen in our portfolio. It has a cult-like following that really goes beyond just being a product and a snack. It's actually considered a lifestyle. Since launching Flamin' Hot Cheetos in 1992, Frito-Lay is continuing to expand their Flamin' Hot product line. There are 15 Flamin' Hot snacks from popcorn to Doritos. It's easy to mistake Flame and Hot's popularity for just another social media trend. But experts say its success is actually a reflection of America's shifting demographics and their desire for more intense flavors. Flame and Hot's rise started with this man, Richard Montañez. Look, I have a PhD. I've been poor, hungry, and determined. Montañez was a janitor at Frito-Lay when he saw a message from the CEO calling on all employees to act like owners. You know, I started, you know, researching my company and I saw no products that were catering to Latinos or to the person who loves spices. Montañez grew up in a migrant farming community east of Los Angeles. And even though Montaña says he didn't have a college degree or formal business training, he prided himself on having an eye for innovation. In a lot of Latino neighborhoods like mine that I grew up in, we have something that is called the uh, elote man. It's a vendor called the corn man. And he puts mayonnaise, butter, cheese, however you want it, lime, chili. Remember I whistled and I said, let me have two. You know, I'm eating and I'm thinking, what could I do? What could I create? And then I looked at that and it looked just like a Cheeto. I thought, what if I put chili on a Cheeto? Montañez called Roger Enrico, Frito-Lay's CEO at the time, to personally pitch his idea over the phone. With the help of his wife, Montañez put together a formal presentation, selling Frito-Lay executives on the promise of an untapped market. Richard's insights into the Hispanic consumer really helped us shape and think about how we should talk to that consumer. That was something that we relied on very heavily. In 1992, the Flamin' Hot flavor was officially launched. Today, it's one of the top-selling snack flavors at Frito-Lay, a company that has over 1,100 snacks in its arsenal. The brand added Flamin' Hot Peanuts in 1997, then Flamin' Hot Cheeto Puffs in 1999, and Flamin' Hot Limon Crunchy Cheetos in 2002. Since then, it's released 11 more snacks and even created a Flamin' Hot fashion line with Forever 21. Flamin' Hot is actually the number one snack in spicy foods. Flamin' Hot flavored snacks saw a 105% increase in sales from 2018 to 2019. One reason for the spike is the brand's strategic approach to marketing its spicy snacks. Remember, I'm flaming hot and you're flaming not. One of the most effective ways to market a snack right now is with an influencer or a celebrity, and you are definitely seeing Frito-Lay play into that. They have musicians who have promoted the products. Chance the Rapper is a big name. He was in the Super Bowl last year with the Backstreet Boys, and they were promoting a Flamin' Hot product. 
You have Post Malone, who rebranded himself Post Limon to promote Flame and Hot Doritos. So you're seeing the brand try things and do things in a way that connects with culture. Can't touch this. And that makes it more shareable, and that makes people hunger for the content and then potentially hunger for the product. But more importantly, Flame and Hot fans are showing enthusiasm for unconventional Flame and Hot experiences. Mukbang, a video genre that originated in South Korea, attracts millions of viewers who enjoy watching excessive amounts of food being consumed in unusual ways. Flame and Hot has been a massive success in the Mukbang category on YouTube, with the top post garnering over 20 million views. In 2018, Frito-Lay opened Flame and Hot inspired pop-ups in New York and Los Angeles, which quickly sold out while attracting a ton of celebs and fans. But while Flame and Hot owes some of its popularity to A-list endorsements, fan pages, and clever marketing schemes, there's a quiet but seismic force underlying its elevation from snack food to American pop culture icon. Immigration. Our demographics have been changing slowly but surely over time. We've seen a great influx of Hispanics as well as Asians. And when they immigrate to the United States, they bring their food cultures with them. And many of their core flavors are on the spicier side. And so as they became a bigger part of our population, we noticed that spicy flavors started popping up a little bit more. And our millennial generation is the most willing generation to use these flavors. America's preferences for new flavors are evolving in lockstep with its changing populace. The two fastest growing ethnic groups in America are Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans. Between 2000 and 2018, the Asian American population grew by nearly 73%. The Hispanic American population also saw significant growth at 63%. Experts say the explosive growth of these two communities are impacting the types of flavors and ingredients used in restaurants and snacks. What restaurants are buying in big numbers are flavors that reflect their cultures. Aleppo chili peppers, for example, that's up about 25%. A Korean barbecue is also up about 57%. Habanero mango, all these flavors that are reflective of these two fast growing demographic groups are what restaurants are serving in greater numbers too. Oftentimes, trends that start in restaurants spill into the snack world. Flamin' Hot Chips might have been early in terms of spicy and bold flavors in the snack world. Research shows that the average American consumes 25% more spicy snacks now than they did a decade ago. And when you spread that across 350 million people, that's a lot of spicy snacks. But as appetites for spicy snacks grow, so do health concerns about consuming them. In recent years, schools across the U.S. have banned Flamin' Hot Cheetos due to growing concerns about the snack chip's nutritional value and addictive properties. And when rapper Lil Xan was sent to the hospital in 2018 after consuming too many Flamin' Hot Cheetos, the incident was highly publicized. Cheetos are dangerous. They're one hell of a drug. But are the chips really that harmful? If someone has an underlying condition, like an ulcer, that can create a situation that is very dangerous in people who don't have that underlying condition, the long-term effects are concerning. With children in particular, they're very vulnerable to this trifecta of sugar, fat, and salt. And so this is something that really taps into their reward system in a way that you don't see in adults. From the Cheeto to the Crunch, Flamin' Hot Snacks are engineered to keep people eating. And it works, maybe too well. There's a science to this compulsive consumption. There are five phenomena that we can say are responsible for this. The first one being a phenomenon known as vanishing caloric density. And that's this idea that when we pop these Cheetos into our mouth, they seem to just disappear. That signals to the brain that we haven't really consumed any calories. The second one is a phenomenon called bliss point, and that leads to this idea of getting this trifecta of sugar, fat, and salt, and reaching the optimum level of pleasure with each of those things. The third phenomena is sensory-specific satiation. 
the idea that if you have a complex flavor layering, your brain stays excited and wants more. The fourth is a capsation endorphin rush. Capsation is the chemical in spicy foods that signals to our brain that we're in pain, causing our brains to release endorphins or feel good molecules. And finally, there's sonic appeal, that crunch. Crunchiness leads people to believe that an item is fresh, which tricks your body into thinking it's eating fresh foods. As Flame and Hot sales continue to climb, so are consumers' desires to purchase healthier snacks. And if you think Frito-Lay isn't paying attention to that demand, you're wrong. When it comes to snacks that people might feel a little bit better about eating, Flamin' Hot is still front and center. In 2019, Frito-Lay brought out Flamin' Hot Smart Food, the popcorn brand. So it's paying attention to those people who still want something with a little bit of spice, but want something that's also maybe reduced fat or reduced sodium. But there's a fine line between the actual nutritional value of the snack and aspirational marketing. This is supposed to be a healthier alternative to the Flaming Hot Cheetos. Looking at the nutrition facts, it's pretty similar to Flaming Hot Cheetos. So even if it's got maybe 10 calories fewer, people are still craving this item because of how it's been designed and are more inclined to perhaps finish the entire bag. In a statement, Frito-Lay said, Flamin' Hot's heat comes from a naturally occurring spice and the amount of heat in one serving size is equal to that of a jalapeno pepper, though they understand why some fans have to consume the snack in moderation. While Frito-Lay's healthier options fall short of what nutritionists might consider healthy, the company is fending off would-be competitors and continuing to dominate the spicy snack space. There are a few brands that are front and center when it comes to spicy things. Flamin' Hot is the gold standard, I think. And it does have some competition. I mean, Takis has definitely brought out a lot of Enfuego flavors. And so to keep that market and to keep its share of the market growing, I think Frito-Lay is going to be paying more attention to those types of influencers and the celebrities who are already fans of its product to bring in more consumers. We want to continue to learn from our consumers about what is it they want to see more of, and we see this continued trend towards fusion. Flamin' Hot's continued success can be credited to the company's willingness to look to its workforce for new ideas, its openness to try something bold, and its investment in America's changing demographics. I think what makes Cheetos Flamin' Hot very special is it originated here in the U.S., and it really came from how the American population was evolving and what Americans wanted from their snacking. And so it really does characterize truly what it means to enjoy food in America, what kind of food experiences you love in the US. Whether it was a happy accident or a calculated risk, Flamin' Hot is a true American success story. This ain't over. This is Blue Bottle, and that's a $5 cup of coffee. So when did this become a thing? Enter the third wave coffee movement, where coffee is considered an artisanal food like wine or craft beer rather than a commodity, and people are willing to pay the price. Blue Bottle is riding this trend and expanding its reach across North America and Asia. But how did Blue Bottle grow from a single coffee cart into a reported $700 million Java juggernaut? The company's meteoric rise started in the small Oakland, California apartment of a struggling musician. Meet James Freeman, the founder of Blue Bottle Coffee. I've only wanted to do two things, and that's play the clarinet and be in coffee. Freeman was trying to make it as a classical musician for eight years, playing with regional orchestras throughout Northern California, before he shifted his focus to a peculiar hobby, roasting coffee beans in his oven. In my career as a clarinetist, there were moments of satisfaction, but they tended to be few and far between. I was very unhappy, very miserable. I could not be in music another moment. So that kind of misery, I think, um, can be a very motivating influence. Freeman began wondering if there were other people like him who were just as dedicated to drinking extremely fresh coffee. 
at the time. There literally was not a place in San Francisco one could go to get a bag of coffee with a roast date stamped on the back. So that seemed very compelling to me, this idea of coffee being fresh food. Freeman was convinced that coffee companies like Starbucks over-roasted their beans. There had to be a better way. The quality of the coffee needed to be the primary focus. Enter the third wave coffee movement. The first wave of coffee, you know, Cro-Magnon man, was coffee in cans, kind of dead. And then the second wave were very influential roasters like Pete's and Starbucks who tended to gravitate towards darker roasts, less expression of terroir. And then the third wave of coffee tends to emphasize lighter roast, more taste of terroir. Usually third wave coffee is used by people in the third wave of coffee. Freeman rented a 186 square foot shed near his apartment in Oakland's Temescal district and bought an old coffee roaster in hopes of expanding his operation. Clarinetists don't accumulate a lot of wealth, so I put in all of the money I had plus a couple credit cards. And in 2001, Freeman began his commercial operation. Freeman racked up $15,000 in debt to launch Blue Bottle and spent two years selling his coffee at farmers markets around San Francisco and Oakland, slowly building a dedicated following. But in January 2004, that all changed. I remember being at the farmers market the Saturday that the fancy food show was in town and it was like a pretty crushing line. 30, 40 people in line looked up, saw all these people in line because word had gotten out somehow. And just feeling like, oh, something happened. A year later, Blue Bottle opened its first location in the heart of San Francisco in a small converted garage. It was like a dead end alleyway that smelled like pee. But just how many consumers are willing to pay $5 for a cup of coffee? I think it's crazy for people to pay $5 for coffee when there's people out here selling coffee for a dollar. I usually pay like $5 for coffee. Personally, I wouldn't pay $5 for coffee, but that's my prerogative. I think it's crazy to pay $5 for a cup of coffee. That's wild. If it's a good cup of coffee, I'd say about $10. The maximum amount I would ever pay for a cup of coffee is probably $6. That's about when it starts getting ridiculous and I hate myself perpetually until I finish the cup of coffee. Today, there are more than 80 Blue Bottle cafes around the world. As of July 2019, there are locations in the Bay Area, New York City, Los Angeles, San Diego, Boston, and D.C. And 14 locations in Japan and two in South Korea. Blue Bottle has helped drive trends within the coffee industry, particularly cold brew and New Orleans-styled iced coffee. It has also developed ready-to-drink products, as well as an online coffee subscription with prices ranging from $8 to $47. Blue Bottle has a reported $700 million valuation, and the company raised a total of $117 million from some impressive outside investors, like former Twitter CEO Evan Williams, Google Ventures, Instagram co-founder Kevin Systrom, financial giants Morgan Stanley and Fidelity Management, U2 singer Bono, actor and singer Jared Leto, and legendary skateboarder Tony Hawk have all invested in Blue Bottle. In 2017, Nestle acquired a 68% stake in Blue Bottle. Blue Bottle sold a majority stake to Nestle uh, that reportedly valued the company north of $700 million. The reactions to the Nestle news were mixed. So just how strong is the demand for super premium coffee? High-end, semi-expensive coffee is simply just not recession-proof. When the economy changes, people are going to switch from buying this third wave coffee, spending $5 a day on their cappuccino, to spending more on Dunkin' Donuts or the street cart outside for that caffeine fix if they need be. Blue Bottle's expansion beyond the Bay Area started once the U.S. economy turned around after the 2008 financial crisis. It opened its first New York City location not long after, in 2010. Most recently, in the past five years, the retail coffee market and the coffee and snack shops industry specifically has increased in annualized 4.6% to reach about 50.7 billion in 2019. 64% of Americans age 18 or older said they've had a cup of coffee the day before, according to a survey from the National Coffee Association in 2018. The latte was the most popular coffee drink among Americans in 2018. Between June 2017 and June 2018, Americans drank more than 67 million lattes. In 2018, cold brew orders were 42% higher than iced coffee orders in the U.S. From 2014 to 2019, 
prominent third wave coffee brands such as Blue Bottle, Stumptown Coffee Roasters, and Intelligentsia Coffee have grown at annualized rates of more than 20%, according to Ibis World. Blue Bottle's entrance into new markets hasn't always gone smoothly. In 2019, it closed two Miami locations about a year after opening. Blue Bottle CEO Brian Meehan cited the opportunity, quote, to invest back in other regions in a statement to the Miami News Times. In the US, although artisanal coffee and third wave coffee has become really popular, that has been mainly kind of segmented to really large cities with typically higher incomes and a lot of international consumers. While that would typically, one would think, fit Miami, if there's already a surplus of coffee establishments in Miami, there may not just be the need. And while much of Blue Bottle's appeal lies in the quality of its coffee, it still faces many challenges, most notably increased competition. So I have to not only compete price-wise with the big competitors like Dunkin' that can give you a coffee for inexpensive and fast, they also have to compete with the other artisan or third-wave coffee operators. Blue Bottle's top competitors include Intelligentsia, Stumptown, and La Colombe. Even Starbucks got into third wave coffee in 2014 when it opened a Starbucks Reserve Roastery in Seattle. It has since opened locations in New York, Shanghai, Milan, and Tokyo. Even their cups don't even say Starbucks, they just kind of have a star on them. They are wanting to associate with the brand that people know and love, but also separate themselves a little bit by trying to become more niche and nuanced. But Blue Bottle would not be here without Starbucks. I think we have a lot to thank Starbucks for in terms of creating a market where people want to go out to coffee and feel like that is a fun and acceptable thing to do. I don't see Starbucks as a competitor. I, I look to companies for inspiration rather than think about competition. Blue Bottle is still going through growing pains. In May 2019, the company recalled 194,000 of its whole bean coffee cans after they started exploding when people opened them. That's a sad one because the product itself was really, really great. The coffee was magically preserved at a peak of freshness for many, many months. I personally don't think we should give up on the cans entirely. So what will help the company continue growing? Staying true to Freeman's original mission. In San Francisco, when we started, there were these, these models, these various sort of Pete's-like, Starbucks-like models of how cafes were supposed to be, and I didn't like those models, and I wanted to do something different, and I was advised by many people with many opinions that those differences were going to make me unsuccessful, where actually people were quite attracted to those differences, the uh, differences of making coffee one cup at a time, the difference of not roasting things super dark, the difference of having each milk drink steamed to order and with latte art on top, those things that made it slightly more labor intensive, a little bit harder, a little bit more expensive. Those were actually the differences that attracted people. Guess where we're going? Yeah. Not that hard to guess. Sweet green, woo! Sweet green, worshiped by millennials and Gen Zers. Oh, about to get me a Hollywood boy! dutifully wait in lines around the block for their locally grown, celebrity chef inspired, premium priced salads. Is salad a hot, trendy, growing category? Absolutely not. When you take one of those big established things that everybody already eats and you elevate or you innovate around that category, it can create growth in what is otherwise a pretty flat marketplace. Gwyneth Paltrow's company Goop and Martha Stewart have endorsed the brand. And Selena Gomez, Catherine McPhee, Kendall Jenner, Cory Booker, and Malia Obama are all customers. There's a big movement of people connecting more deeply with their food. We were at uh, the right place at the right time. In the ever-competitive fast casual dining category, Sweet Green's become a unicorn, valued at over $1 billion. If I had told you 25 years ago when Starbucks only had a few locations that someday it would be a global phenomenon or Chipotle, nobody would have believed that you know, Starbucks would now be worth $60 billion or Chipotle worth $16 billion, but that's what's happened and well, that's what we feel with, with uh, Sweetgreen. So has Sweetgreen found the new sweet spot in America's palate? And will it become the next big thing? Uh.
Sweet Green was started 11 years ago by three seniors at Georgetown University who met in an entrepreneurship class. We were sick of eating at the same places. None of them made us feel that good. The most delicious food, the coolest food, was all the least healthy. And we wanted to solve that problem. Live the sweet life with us, you know? The one thing they all had in common, they were the children of immigrant entrepreneurs. And like their parents, they wanted to run their own businesses. The very first menu uh, we actually made in my co-founder Nick's dorm room. Uh, and we even had these little you know, anonymous surveys people could fill out. The group raised $300,000 from 50 investors, mainly family and friends. And in 2007, three months after graduating, they opened the first Sweet Green. It was a 560 square foot shack near the Georgetown University campus, and the team had to install everything from scratch. It had no plumbing, it had no electricity. We really had no idea what we were doing. But people kept coming back. Within a year and a half, Sweet Green opened two more locations in DC and Maryland. By the time they made it to New York with store number 20 in 2013, they had raised over $35 million. We think there's a real chance to build Sweet Green into a, a national brand and maybe someday a, a global brand. And that's exactly what started happening. Core to Sweet Green's business model has always been its direct relationship with farmers. The first thing we do when we do come to a new city is connect with the local farmers and producers and build that supply chain. So every city has its own set of different farmers, producers, and growers. It's no easy task and was a risky goal for such a large scale. Many, but not all, are organic. Consumer packaging is compostable, and foods like steelhead, while less known, are offered in lieu of less sustainable ones like salmon. The menu changes seasonally and varies slightly by region. Sweetgreen has been criticized for its prices and for attracting a less than diverse crowd. The company says prices have gone up over the years to increase wages and benefits for its employees. So I think I'm going to go get some sweet green for dinner because I'm on my own for dinner. In yesterday land, consumers might have wanted a Rolex watch or some other badge product. Now food is a new badge product. The new rage, if you will, it used to be generations spent a fair amount of money on apparel and that was sort of a badge and today food is a badge. For six years, Sweet Green put on an annual music festival called the Sweet Life Festival, with a lineup that included Kendrick Lamar, Solange, The Weeknd, and Haim. But the company called it quits in 2017, due in part to festival fatigue and declining customer numbers. Sweet Green also teamed up with Kendrick Lamar on a shirt and salad in honor of his song. The company collaborates with celebrity chefs, including David Chang, Nancy Silverton, Mark Bittman, and Dan Barber, to develop new menu items. The key to attracting and maintaining a customer base is a combination of consistency and spontaneity. Consistency means I deliver an exceptional product, and I do it again and again and again. Spontaneity means I'm changing things up. The challenge for brands is making the spontaneity mixed up somewhat so that it's not predictable. Otherwise, the high user, the one who's highly frequent, uh, gets bored with it. Sweet Green now has 91 restaurants in eight states, in addition to a corporate delivery program called Outpost, currently at 25 WeWorks and 75 other companies. In November 2018, Sweet Green became the first ever restaurant unicorn. The one billion dollar valuation. After receiving a 200 million dollar seed age financing round led by Fidelity Investments. Other investors include restaurateurs Danny Meyer and Daniel Ballou, former Whole Foods CEO Walter Robb, and former AOL executive Steve Case and Ted Leonis. The total equity raised now is $365 million. The company says it plans to eventually go beyond just salads and bowls and plans to add more cities and locations to its roster. The key will be, can they make that supply chain transparency story work in the U.S. and internationally without growing so quick that they outrun the supply chain? Today, over 50% of Sweet Green's business happens digitally. You know, the things that we do see creating growth is the fast casual space in general, uh, you know, digital ordering, delivery, as more and more consumers actually want to consume the food at home. The company plans to go further with blockchain. By leveraging blockchain, we will know at any given moment exactly where our food came from, when it was picked, and when it got to us. And not only will we know, we'll be able to surface that information to our customers. This technology, which is said to grow rapidly in the agriculture sector over the next five years, 
could help prevent outbreaks like the romaine lettuce E. coli outbreak in California in 2008. Tonight, the head of the FDA says the romaine lettuce responsible for that outbreak that has sickened dozens of people likely started in California. Sweetgreen is now cashless nationwide. The company made the switch in 2017 for both efficiency and robbery prevention, but the concept of cashless stores has sparked debate and even been banned in some states. The company also hopes its technology will give consumers a more personalized experience. Over time, as we start to get to know you and you're able to share information, whether that be your 23andMe or other sort of microbiome data with us, we're able to then curate menus based off of your preferences. Time will tell whether this technology will put Sweetgreen ahead of the pack or whether that's even what consumers want or need. While other things will change, like our restaurants, the way in which we serve food, our mission will never change. As we get bigger, the opportunity also gets bigger, and we're just getting started. This is oat milk. It's one of dozens of non-dairy milks to enter the dairy alternative scene over the last 20 years. It seems like these days, if it grows from the ground, someone will try to milk it. Plant-based milks from almond to soy are big business. From August 2018 through August 2019, total sales of plant-based milks were about $1.8 billion. It's safe to say plant-based beverages have moved from the fringe to mainstream. But of all the brands to come to market, Oatly is an outlier. When the Swedish company's American supply of barista blend oat milk ran dry in 2018, it started an online bidding war. A case of 12 packs of Oatly that sells today for around $50 was selling for over $200 on Amazon. A small Swedish company with an unknown product in an increasingly crowded field muscled its way into coffee shops and homes around the country. Here's how Oatly did it. There's a good reason oat milk was invented in Sweden. The Scandinavian country is known for its dairy production and consumption. Even with softening demand, Sweden produced around 754,000 tons of milk in 2018. And back in 1990, Swedes consumed on average 330 pounds of milk per person per year. For comparison, that year, Americans drank about 233 pounds. But as milk consumption grew, so did awareness about lactose intolerance, a condition that makes it difficult for some people to digest the sugar, called lactose, in cow's milk. And that growing awareness of the digestive issues surrounding cow's milk created a huge opportunity for plant-based alternatives. Oat milk was developed in the 1990s by Richard Oste, who was working as a food scientist at Lund University in Sweden. Oste studied under Professor Arne Dolkvist, known for discovering the underlying factors to lactose intolerance in 1963. Our founders just figured like, okay, if a vast majority of the world population are intolerant to milk, why don't we make something that is actually designed for human beings, not baby cows? And they looked like all over the place, but they found the solution right in front of the nose, which is like oats. Ricard and his brother Bjorn patented the invention and founded Oatly in 1994. But it would take 20 years for oat milk to finally gain traction. To talk about the rise of Oatly is to look at the downfall of dairy milk. Since 2015, cow's milk sales have dropped by about $3.4 billion. But it's still in first place, by a lot. Total sales of cow's milk in the U.S. from August 2018 through August 2019 were about $12 billion. Sales of oat milk during that same time period were just $40 million. Experts say only one in 10 consumers use a milk alternative, and only 16% of those consumers use oat milk. So it's still a very small portion of the, of the population that uses oat milk, but it's quickly rising. Consumer trends are in Oatly's favor. We know that Oatly came to the market in 2016, and certainly with the cult following that it's, that it's grown within the coffee community, we saw that in about in 20, 2017, 2018. But really over the past year, it's really grown. Nielsen data shows that from 2018 to 2019, sales of oat milk in the US skyrocketed from six million to close to $40 million in sales. So that's reflecting a 500% increase in dollar sales. 
which is really impressive. Oatly generated over $100 million in sales in 2018. And we're gonna double that this year. And we expect to, that to be doubled the year after that too, you know? It's truly an exponential curve. Oatly sat in relative obscurity in Malmo, Sweden for its first 20 years. But in 2012, Oatly brought in a new CEO with a radical new vision for the brand. Wow, wow, no cow, no, 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 wow. In 2014, Tony Peterson completely overhauled Oatly's image. Peterson revamped the logo and packaging. By only using English on its packaging, he was able to give the brand an identifiable voice no matter where in the world it was sold. He commissioned an environmental impact study to show that producing oat milk was better for the environment than dairy. The company created oddly endearing YouTube videos and came up with a barista blend specifically designed to get the attention of third wave coffee shops. So, with a new look and a tasty product, Oatly set its sights on America. If you look at the household penetration of plant-based milk, it's, it's way higher in the U.S. And you can see that it was continuing to grow. So, like, obviously, like, we needed to be there. Uh, there was no other way around it. Oatly's introduction to U.S. customers in 2017 was unique, to say the least. Oatly's U.S. general manager, Mike Messersmith, said, getting people to try a new brand, let alone a product they've never heard of before, is almost impossible. So rather than enter the U.S. market through a large grocery chain or beverage distributor, Oatly sent representatives to introduce the product in person at high-end coffee shops around New York City. We wanted to try to think of what would be that ideal first experience um, for someone to be able to try the product for the first time. And for us, you know, we thought about specialty coffee shops and tea shops, where if you were able to uh, take the recommendation of your local barista who you see every day and try our product through an expertly prepared latte or cappuccino, that would be a really amazing way to kind of be introduced to even just the idea of oat milk. The gamble paid off. I always make jokes that it's like oat o'clock because it seems like it comes in waves. Apparently, world travels fast in the coffee community especially when there's a hot new product with extremely limited supply. When I started working here, um, our distributor would only give us about nine cases of Oatly a week. There was a time when we were like seriously running out and really had to be careful with how, <laughs> how we were using it and like to not waste too much when steaming or like putting it out. But nowadays I think that the great Oatly shortage of 2019 is over. Oatly was introduced to the US in late 2016 via one exclusive coffee partner. Intelligentsia. In January 2017, it expanded to other shops, and by the end of that year, it was served in about 650 locations. As of October 2019, Oatly is available in about 7,000 shops and 5,000 grocery stores in the United States. The problem with such rapid growth is that Oatly actually had to meet its crushing demand. When we entered the U.S., we had no idea of how big it was going to become, and, and especially not how fast it was going to happen. So we were a bit like unprepared and taken by surprise by the massive hype around uh, the brand. Oh, that's my nice. favorite. Oatly was my favorite too. In April 2019, Oatly opened a 20,000 square foot manufacturing facility in New Jersey and is opening another in Utah in the spring of 2020. Now that Oatly has a foothold in the US, it's plotting its next big expansion. China. We used the same strategy of entering through coffee shops like uh, Third Way Coffee Shop and then expand. And it's been working really, really well. There are actually more Third Way Coffee Shops in Shanghai than there is in New York City, which is pretty interesting. Oatly is undeniably gaining in popularity with coffee lovers, but is it catching on with the general public? I have never tried oats milk. I have tried oat milk. I love it in coffee. I've never tried oats milk. It's pretty bland. Yeah, that's all I drank. <laughs> I've drank a lot of milk. In fact, I used to drink a gallon a day because I was a bodybuilder. But I don't know if I've ever had oat milk. I actually watched a video on cows, and it really broke my heart. So I jumped onto the oat train, and I only drink oat milk now, and also because of my skin. But is it as healthy as regular cow's milk? Not necessarily. 
from a nutritional standpoint, cow's milk, of course, if you don't have any, you know, allergy or when you're looking at lactose intolerance, you're just purely looking nutritionally, cow's milk and then soy milk tend to be more superior than some other alternatives. While oat milk isn't a nutritional replacement for whole milk, it has the two things that matter to baristas, consistency and taste. I can pour equally as complex as designs with oat milk as I can with whole milk. I can't pour complex stuff with soy milk or almond milk, just like the consistency of it is not close enough to whole milk. But I think Oatly manages to get that like sweetness and that creaminess of soy milk without like without having that cake batter kind of aftertaste, chemical-y kind of aftertaste. Oatly's competitors are starting to take notice of its increasing popularity. Major players like Silk and Quaker have recently come out with their versions of oat milk. So we see a number of big players playing in the space and I think that that's a good thing, right? Beyond oat milk, we're seeing other varieties now coming to the market like oat milk yogurt, oat milk frozen desserts, oat milk creamers, even within the ready to drink coffee category, you're seeing the oat milk lattes now coming in bottled form. So I think it's, it's good, it's an exciting time for the alternative dairy category. And the field is expected to get even more crowded, but replacing Oatly's success will be difficult. Brands like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat were able to recreate the burger eating experience without sacrificing taste. And that is exactly what Oatly was able to do.